I think we're I think we're on our fifth week of covering first and second Thessalonians. It's either our fifth or sixth week. And <clears throat> just a reminder to everyone watching on Facebook Live, but also to those of you here, if you want my notes or the slides, you can download them on the bottom of the website. So I mean, we will obviously be showing the slides, but you can always get my notes and the slides on the bottom of the website. There's links. <clears throat> so this morning, the name of my message is the second coming of Christ, and I'm going to quickly jump in. So here's our text from chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians. Brothers and sisters, <clears throat> we do not want you to be uninformed about those who have died so that you will not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have already died knowing Him. According to the word of the Lord, this is really, this is something I'd never noticed until this week. Paul says, according to the word of the Lord, now we all remember, I've mentioned this numerous times, the Gospels do not exist yet. This, these are some of the first letters written for the New Testament. So when Paul says, according to the word of the Lord, we have to remember he wasn't around. He wasn't a tw one of the twelve traveling with Jesus. Somehow, and he says that he got his Gospel directly from Jesus. I don't know exactly what he's referencing, but we're going to see in a little bit that he actually references a known saying of Jesus before the Gospels are ever written. So when he says, according to the word of the Lord, Paul has heard this either directly from Christ or he heard it from Peter or one of the twelve. We tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have already died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Apparently, some of the folks in Thessalonica have died, and some of the, <clears throat> probably, either family members or other church members are very concerned that what's, they already died, are they going to participate when Jesus comes back? And so Paul's encouraging them. Yes, they're not gone. They're waiting just like you, just like us who are alive for, the, for Christ to come back. So we're about to get into what is called the second coming. This is the most extensive passage of Paul in the New Testament, what we're going to read this morning. <clears throat> now, for starters, I want you to know, <clears throat> not all branches of Christianity believe in the second coming the way I'm going to present it. There are several significant parts of Christianity that believe this is metaphorical language not to be taken literally. Okay? <clears throat> the literal reading of the second coming actually was really never presented until about 150 years ago. So it's somewhat new and it's mainly among evangelicals. But even among evangelicals there are significant differences. It's all about the end times we're living and we've all, maybe most of us have heard we're living in the end days, the last days. And there are a lot of terms that come into play. If I could get the slide here. The coming or appearing of Jesus, the parousia, the rapture, the great tribulation. And all of that begs the question, when is this going to happen? And so we get more terminology. There are those who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. There are those who believe in a mid-tribulation rapture. There are those who believe in a post-tribulation rapture. And that's not all. 
<laughs> then we have the millennial reign. A thousand years when from Revelation chapter 20, Jesus is supposed to come to earth and rule the whole earth as the king of the earth for a thousand years. Well, that sounds simple, right? Wrong. There's, there are a lot of different people who have a lot of different positions on the millennial reign about when it's going to happen. And so, I think it's on the next slide. You have premillennialism. You have postmillennialism. And you have amillennialism. And then you have those tribulation views combined with the three. You, got, you have nine different views of when it could happen. All this could happen. And to be honest with you, my head starts spinning. It's just... So I'm not here this morning to tell you what to believe about this stuff, but I do want you to know why I presented those terms and why I'm going to share some more before I get into what I believe God's saying to us. As the pastor teacher of this church, I'm called to do two things. It's very, very a very simple job description, actually. <clears throat> I'm to faithfully teach the truths that I see are clear in the biblical text. And I say that all the time. There are a lot of things in the Scriptures that are not clear. And when they're not clear, we need to not be dogmatic. In fact, Paul talks about this in the letter to the Romans. He says, whatever you believe, name some, some things that are not clear. And he says, whatever you believe about these things... Keep between yourself and God. We would probably have a lot less denominations if we would have done that through Protestant Christianity. If we had just been a little more humble that there are things that are not clear. But the second thing is to love and challenge and encourage the folks who come to this church. That's my second obligation. In 1993, as I approached my ordination, I knew that I would have to give an account for certain doctrinal views. And I knew what they were. By this time, I'd already, 1993, I'd already read my Bible cover to cover more than 10 times. I'd already spent countless hours. You know, I don't want to go into it, but, you know, the study we did on spiritual disciplines was a reflection of me during my real rigid years, you know, where I had to do things to be right with God. And one of them was to spend some time, many time, many hours, you know, studying my Bible. Now, I didn't do it because I thought I would, you know, be judged for not doing it, but I really wanted to do it. So I'd already done a lot of Bible reading, a lot of studying. I'd, I was not yet trained academically, but I'd already read a lot of academic writings. But here's what I want you to know. My views today are pretty much the same they were in 1995 when I set for my ordination. My views on this topic, on these issues, have not changed much. Maybe I'm getting a message right now. <laughs> uh, these are doctrines that I had not been able to come to any clear position on. So I was concerned because I knew to be ordained I would be asked about these things. And so I spent about two years reading, thinking about, and traveling to listen to experts on eschatology, the end of times. So I traveled to hear two or three different experts walk through their views, and they both, or they all had charts set across the platform. Anybody ever been to one of these? If I could get the next slide, this is an example of a, of a, a chart. There's no chart? Oh, you know what? I think I forgot to put it in there. I apologize. <laughs> I apologize. But you know what? It's a chart that doesn't make much sense to me. But I would go hear these experts, and they would have like five charts across the front. And, and I remember as a, I mean, I was, I think I was in my early 30s. And I remember sitting and listening to these men thinking, okay, he disagrees with the last expert that I watched. His chart doesn't cover some of the same issues. They disagree about Daniel chapter 7 and they disagree about Ezekiel and blah, blah, blah. And I found myself just going, man, 
Listening to these experts is not helping me. And I just found it very difficult to follow all the intricate details. So, when I took my ordination exam, you know, with 25, 30 other people, I was told, you know, here are these doctrinal views that we expect you to believe. If you don't give 100% agreement on any of these, we need you to f f write down why not on a separate sheet of paper. So I was, the, I was the last candidate to leave that day, and I wrote seven pages of uh, handwritten notes to tell them why I didn't give 100% agreement on several of these doctrinal positions. And when I did my oral exam, they grilled me on some of them. So that was 1995, and I still do not have a clear position on these things. The evidence is just not clear for me. Not clear enough that I should be dogmatic. And whatever you believe about the rapture and the tribulation and the millennial reign and all that stuff does not affect your salvation. It's not what we call in good academic circles, it's not salvific. So maybe we shouldn't worry about the details. That's my first point that I would make. I just don't think it matters what you think about the end of the world. Jesus told us it's not for you to know. He, and I'm going to cover that text in a little bit. But Jesus clearly says it's not for you to know. So, I could never make charts like these guys. Because I would feel like I'm going against a very clear statement of Jesus. Now, I'm going to spend about five minutes on a topic that I know many of you have heard me make comment about, but I want to lay a little bit more groundwork because the end of the world is encapsulated in what we call Jewish apocalypticism and I want you to know what that is many of you probably remember in the Old Testament after King Solomon died his two sons fought over the kingdom and they split the kingdom into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah well during this period is when the Old Testament prophets started coming on the scene, warning the people of the coming judgment if they failed to follow God. But especially the northern kingdom, you know, built their own altar and decided we're not going to go down to the temple, so we're going to do our own little thing up here in the northern kingdom, and the prophets are like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. That's really not right, and if you do that, God's going to, he's going to bring judgment on you. And so eventually... Yeah, you can go to the next slide, I think. Uh, the northern kingdom of Israel is attacked by the Assyrians and they were taken into captivity in 722 was the very last of the, the defeat. And now the northern kingdom of Israel is called the ten lost tribes because we don't know what happened to them. The Jews of northern Israel were taken by the Assyrians and transplanted all over to dilute their strength as a people. And they intermarried and they're now called the ten lost tribes of Israel. Well, about 150 years later, the kingdom of Judah went through the same thing. We have pottery pieces from the time period that have paintings of Jews being led by the Babylonians into captivity, chained up. And being led kind of it always reminds me when I see it of the trail of tears in the United States when we led the Indians to the reservations. This was during the time of Jeremiah and Habakkuk. Isaiah had warned them about a hundred years prior as things got really bad. And he told them, God is going to put an end to Jerusalem. It will be desolate, but he will then reach all the Gentiles. So the prophets started in this time period when they were warning when Israel, when Judah is taken into the Babylonian captivity. The prophets start giving a new message that had not been seen or heard as, as, as clearly as the prophets started delivering it. That God would bring a future event when he would reestablish his kingdom. He would reestablish his kingdom through the Messiah. 
and that things would be different. And I want to read. I don't have these on my slides, but just listen to closely to this. These are three different New, uh, Old Testament prophets speaking of this future time frame. And these are the these are strands of what we call Jewish apocalypticism. Okay, this is when this literature begins to happen. What we call Jewish apocalypticism are these prophets foretelling this event that would happen in the future, the reestablishment of God's people. The days are coming. This is one probably a lot of you are going to recognize. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Judah. I will put their law in their minds and write it on their hearts. That is crazy for the Jews, right? Because the law of Moses is inscribed on rocks and then it's put down in, in uh, scrolls and no one can touch it unless you're a priest. And now we have Jeremiah saying that God is saying, I will put my law in their hearts. I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Jeremiah 31. Here's another one. In my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He was given authority and glory and sovereign power. All nations and all peoples of every language worshipped Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion and will not pass away. And His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. That's Daniel chapter 7. Here's the last one. Then the Lord will go out and fight against the nations who oppose Israel as he fights on the day of battle. On that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west. That's Zechariah. Also, in addition to the Old Testament prophets, we have a book called the Book of Enoch which is circulating the last 300 years before Christ appears. And the book of Enoch is, is an important book because two or three New Testament writers quote from it. For those of you who have been hearing some of our messages in the past, the, the Qumran community living in the Dead Sea area, they had war scrolls, and war scrolls talk is another Jewish apocalyptic writing set. And it talks about the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness, and that one day... God will lead the kingdom of light and destroy the kingdom of darkness. He will bring the Son of Man out of the Daniel text. Well, in these war scrolls, they had the book of Enoch. And the book of Enoch was very important to them. So, in many of these texts, the Messiah comes on the clouds accompanied by angels. So, in a nutshell, I've just given you the genre of what Jewish apocalypticism is. Okay? It's meant to reveal, revelation, the hidden knowledge of what God's going to do to end the world and how He plans to do it. However, one of the problems for us is that these types of writings are filled with symbolism and these very texts that foretold the coming of Messiah were believed by the Israelites when Jesus came. And because they read the text literally, they missed it. Jesus didn't come on the clouds with angels, did He? He was born in a manger. And the scribes and Pharisees, the experts of the law, are like, who is this guy? Who is this guy? What is he talking about? He's from Galilee. And because the texts were taken literally, they missed it. Now that's not the only reason they missed it. They had all kinds of problems in their hearts. But that's the challenge with the end of the world texts. How far do we take it literally and how much credit do we give to metaphor and symbolism? And that makes it very complicated. But, if I, if I haven't made it complicated enough, I'm going to put another, throw another wrench into the system. But, Jesus was an apocalyptic Jew. He speaks things about the end of the world. And so we have Paul doing it as well. And we have the revelation by John. So you cannot discount Jewish apocalypticism. You just have to, you have to realize that it's not easy. 
I mean, that's why when I went and listened to experts, I heard disagreements between them because it's not easy to take all these pieces of data from Old Testament prophets and New Testament texts and fit them in and make them work. It just becomes complicated and problematic. Okay, that's my introduction. <laughs> not to worry. My focus of what I believe God wants to say to us is not that long, so let's pray. Lord, we want to hear from you. We sang about it. We feel your presence from week to week for which we are grateful. We believe your scriptures are inspired to help us. And we're asking you this morning to open our hearts, open our ears to hear. Give us, give us a sense of what is real, what is true, what is right, what we can count on. I ask you in, in, your, in your holy name, amen. Okay, <clears throat> I'm going to start my application with a very simple text. Well, it's not simple, but it's more, it's fairly simple. Acts chapter 1, Jesus had spent 40 days after the resurrection appearing and then disappearing amongst the disciples. Remember, he's in a glorified body. He just shows up and talks to him a bit, and then he decides to walk through a wall and disappear and so he'd been with the disciples for 40 days. <clears throat> and then after the resurrection, we get this text in Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 6. Next slide. Then they gathered around him. Really listen to this, you guys. They gathered around him and they asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Pretty straightforward question. You remember they asked Jesus that one time when he was before the resurrection, and that's when he gives the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24. And he says to them in verse 7, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. And then look what he says. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him. And as they were looking up into the sky, he was, as he was going, suddenly two men dressed in white appeared. And they say to him, men of Galilee, why do you stand staring into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back. The parousia, he will come back. He will appear again in the same way that you have just seen him leave. Now, this to me is a very <laughs> clear and simple text. Jesus is asked point blank. Because you remember, we, when we did Mark's Gospel, a lot of people thought Jesus was going to throw the Romans off and set up the messianic kingdom and they were going to rule the world and, and Jesus kept trying to get them to see no that's not what we're doing so here they are again now he's resurrected man he's walking through walls Is, are you about to do it Jesus are you about to reestablish and he says no it's not for you to know the times and the dates and if you remember in Matthew 24 he says the angels don't know I don't even know Jesus said the son of man doesn't even know and so I think that's important in Acts 1 that we see that. And, but then, then note what he tells them. You're going to receive the Holy Spirit, and then what I, he basically says, no, you're, you're worried about that? Let me tell you what I want you to worry about. And he gives them what we call the Great Commission. One of four instances of the Great Commission. You're going to receive power, and then I want you to go and be my witnesses in all the world. Tell people who I am and what I've done and what will and, and that I'll be coming back. Now I want us to continue the text that I read to start us in 1 Thessalonians 4 doesn't stop at the end of chapter 4. It goes, I mean, you know, in the original letter, it didn't have chapters. So I'm going to read the continuation of what Paul says, chapter 5, verse 1. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates. 
We do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And he's quoting a saying of Jesus right there. That's in, I think it's in every one of the synoptic gospels. Jesus says it'll be like a thief in the night. Well, what does that mean? It means you don't know when it's going to come. You know, Jesus made a comment in one of his parables. If you knew when the man was going to break in your house, you would have been prepared, but you don't know. So Paul's using a saying of Jesus. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. When Jesus gives his discourse in, his discourse in Matthew 24, he says, just like in the days of Noah, everybody's marrying and given in marriage, and then all of a sudden, they're wiped out. And, that's what, and that was the same text that Jesus says, it'll be like a thief in the night. And then after this passage, after verse 3, and I didn't want to read it, but I will tell you, Paul continues on by saying, look, you're not going to be taken by surprise because you're children of the light. Only the children of the darkness don't see it coming. And thus I've been talking about light and darkness. Because for, and that is, light and darkness is Jewish apocalypticism. The idea that at the end of the world, there's going to be light and darkness battling against each other. Okay. So here's what I think about the end of the world and all that stuff. And I said this last week. We are in a battle. We are in a battle right now between light and darkness. Doesn't matter if you don't believe it. It's true. Doesn't matter if you're not participating in it. You actually are participating. You just don't know it. We are in a war between God and and the powers of darkness. And I think our culture is part of that war. Culture, every culture, on its own, moves away from the kingdom of light. It's just by definition, it's almost the third law, the third law of thermodynamics. Things left to themselves lean towards chaos, deteriorate. Scriptures are very clear to me that Jesus will return. I don't know when. I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know about the tribulation and the rapture. I mean, you know, I believe those things, but I don't know when it's going to happen. I can't tell you. All I do know, it's very clear that Jesus will return. And when He returns, the texts are very clear. When He returns, He will, bring, he will be bringing judgment. He's not going to come as the Prince of Peace, I've heard it said. He's going to come as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He's going to come with a a, a sword drawn. That's what the revelation tells us. As we read the Thessalonian letters, it seems clear to me that Paul expected Jesus any day in his lifetime. And I think that's what we need to be like. We need to believe and know that it could come at any moment as a thief in the night. So I believe in the rapture. I believe in the thousand year reign. I, I believe in the great tribulation. Even though I think Christians have faced what they thought was a tribulation over and over again. I believe those things. But I have no idea when and how it's all going to be pieced together. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't affect my daily life of living for Christ. And purposing to be a part of the kingdom of light for His glory. I don't think your salvation is at stake by the events and how they're going to play out. And I've learned as I've grown older in Christ, I, another reason I like the Apostles' Creed, because it speaks of this. He ascended into heaven. That's what we just read about. The ascension. And He sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there He will come to judge the living and the dead. Live your life for the kingdom of God. I think this, the imminent return of Christ is, and I think that's what the scriptures portray, that all this stuff's going to happen, 
So all this stuff's going to happen. But what we really need to know is Jesus could return right now. That's always been the case in the church. Belief in the imminent return of Jesus. You know, John describes it this way, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And that's meant to keep us from getting our eyes off what God wants in our lives. Because none of us want Him to return when we're goofballing around doing stupid stuff. Right? Nobody wants to get caught, in a sense, not living for Him. He, he gives parables about this. You know, the, the, the virgins who don't bring enough oil in their lamps, you know, and I don't want to go into that. But Now, that's not meant to scare me. I don't live my life in fear of being rejected. I did as a young man. I was taught that, you know, if he returns and you're not about his business, you know, he's going to leave you and you might be doomed. Well, I don't, I don't believe that. But when he comes back, I, I, I want to be, you know, doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Not doing stupid stuff that doesn't concern him. You know, it doesn't help his kingdom. I want to stand before him. And if, if I read the text clear, and Paul talks about it in two or three different letters, we're going to stand before the what he calls the Bema seat, the judgment seat. It's not to judge us whether we're saved or not, but you're going to stand before Christ and give an account of your life and how you lived it. I want him to look at me and, and say, you know what? You did good. You know, yeah, you messed up. You messed up. You, you did some stupid things, but you did good. That's what I want him to say to me. I don't want him to say, uh, you know, you were a disappointment to me, but, you know, you can still come in. I mean, I want him to be happy. Just like when I played sports, you know, I want the coach happy. I want the coach to tell me I did a good job. If I didn't, I didn't need the coach to tell me. <laughs> it was apparent to me. My challenge to you this morning is, and it's very similar to last week, In light of the return of Christ and the, to the fact that we will all have to give an account, live for Him. Live for Him. Don't live for yourself. Don't live to fulfill the American dream. This is a great message for those of you visiting from other. Don't live for the American dream. That's not the kingdom of God. Being successful, making money. Look, you got to pay your bills. you got to work. Paul's pretty clear in the Thessalonian letters. You better be working. Work hard. Don't be dependent on anybody. But it's not about building a kingdom on this planet. You know, you can't take it with you, right? You went, you came into the world buck naked, and when you're on the other side, that's what you'll have. You'll have the skin you, you, you lived in, but it'll probably be different skin. It'll be <laughs> glorified skin. But you're not going to carry your, you know, I'm not going to carry my wonderful diploma with me to, oh, I did good, didn't I, God? I mean, that thing's going to melt with fervent heat. It's going to be ashes, that, that diploma. So don't live for self. Don't live to be happy. Happiness is good. God gives us happiness. But live for Him. Live for what matters. Live your life for what counts. You remember I talked about Pascal's wager last week. If I live for this and I'm wrong, I haven't really lost anything. But if you don't live for this and you're wrong, you're, gonna, you're not going to be happy. You're going to stand before Christ and He's going he's gonna to tell you things you don't want to hear. I don't want that in my life. And that's a motivation for me. It is. I don't, want to, I don't want to fail him, but I also want him to be pleased with me. You know? Now, I'm not earning my way. 
It's a funny line there. I'm not earning my way. But I want to be obedient to Him. I want to live for the kingdom of light. I want to be on His side when it all comes down. Right? I don't want to have any question in His mind. Are you with me? Or are you not? I want it to be clear I'm with Him. So live to serve Christ. Live to serve Christ. He deserves your best. He deserves your life. He gave Himself for you, and He deserves you to live for Him. Amen? Amen. You want to take this, Jim? Mm. Okay, thoughts, discussion, questions. So when do we live for Christ? Always. Always. When we were singing that last song, mm -hmm. the word of the Lord that came to me was surrender. You know, surrender it all to Jesus. Mm -hmm. The second song I think in that song made me think that, you know, just surrender your life, surrender everything to Him. If you want it all, all of what He's got for you, not material things, but if you want it all, you surrender it all. And how often do we have to do that? Every, every day. Every day. Sometimes, Always. Moment. Every minute. Sometimes every minute <laughs> of every day. Well, well, sometimes, sometimes twice a minute. Sometimes we do it after we realize that we're not doing it. Sure. I mean, at least for me. Well, you you don't know what you don't know until you know, you and, and it's know brought to your attention. You're like, oh, oops. And that's usually the response. Sorry. <laughs> it's gonna leave a mark. <laughs> so we have to, you know, Paul talks about walking out our salvation daily, uh, and I, I believe what he's talking about is choosing Jesus every day, choosing to do that right thing. And it's not a work salvation. It's, it's like I was talking about. When you love somebody, you want to please them. And we can, you know, sometimes we offer um, a sacrifice of praise. And, you know, sometimes it's a joyful noise and sometimes it's just a noise. But it comes out of more what our heart is. And if our heart is... I don't want to be doing this. I'm just going to sing this song. Is that a is that a joyful no, noise? Is that a, a pleasing fragrance to him? And my guess would be, well, yeah, you did the whole. I did it out of obligation. But isn't it so much better when we choose to do it? When we want to do it? When we desire to make our Father happy, please. Mm. To me, that's better. And sometimes we have to choose, you know, you know, the Psalms are full of praise the Lord, O oh my soul, because David didn't want to. So he's talking to himself, saying, All right, soul, self, we're gonna praise God whether you want to or not. And then sometimes you do have to fake it till you make it. Because you have those days where you're like, It is not gonna work out today. But I've got to choose whether I'm going to allow my bad attitude to drag me down or I'm going to choose. You know, the right thing is this. So, God, I give you this thing. Oh, dang. I give it back to you. Dang. <laughs> Sometimes we limp on through the day like that. That's part of the why we come together. Um, so my thoughts when we were singing was, when we sang the second song today, it was talking about seeking His presence and His beauty mm -hmm. and His glory. And so the thoughts came to me that His beauty is in His creation. And guess what? We are His creation. And His presence and His glory dwells in us. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, in a temple, in a box somewhere mm -hmm. now. It's right. with us. Mm -hmm. And... Then as we sang the last song talking about, you know, the fire in us, that, it's like, I, I could see this, you know how you, you've had a fire, 
and now there's those red coals. Mm -hmm. And if you gather them together and push them together and just blow on them a little bit, it blazes back up. Mm -hmm. And that's us coming together. We all have this little fire in us, but when we get separated, it's like it dies down. Yeah. And when we come back together and we praise and worship, the Holy Spirit just blows across mm -hmm. us. And Amen. Whoosh, yes. This morning's present. You know, that's Amen. this morning mm -hmm. happened. Yeah. And it's our job to carry that fire and help each other stay strong and help each other keep that ablaze mm -hmm. and then bring it to others to reignite a fire. Or light a fire in someone else. Mm. That's good. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> it's very good. Because you think about a coal by itself. Mm -hmm. How long does it stay? Mm -hmm. Not very. It productive. takes. It takes the group. I have a testimony that goes along with what Dana said. I had a rough week, and that's not my testimony. But my, <laughs> testimony my testimony is this: my central air went out among all the other things going on in my life, and my church family came together and uh, loaned me air conditioners, little window units to put around in my house. Tanner came and helped me put them, get them in and you know, helped my son get them in and he helped me move some furniture that needed to be moved. And it, it was a blessing. It, it just, the love that I felt was wonderful. And that's what this church is all about. <clears throat> Anybody else? All right, well, let's, let's choose daily, possibly minute by minute, to serve the Lord our God and, and just seek after Him, seek after His love, seek after His face. Yes. So, Lord Jesus, thank you yes. for you. We ask that you would bless us because we want to bless others. Lord, Help us to choose you each day. Help us to walk in paths of righteousness. Help us to love your people. So Lord, be with us and bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.